Good morning, everyone. My name is Annika Becker. I'm the ESG and Sustainability Lead, and it's 10.30 on the dot, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'll pass it to my colleague, Rajat. Thanks, Annika. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it out, especially with the inclement weather. My name is uh, Rajat Sebastian. I'm the head of ESG and Sustainable Investing. And I, you know, I'm only going to be here for about 30 seconds just to welcome you all to this event. Um, you know, we're hoping that this is the first of several events where we can have practitioners, academics, other experts around, I guess, a relatively small community uh, to help build the ecosystem and, and deepen our understanding and your understanding and our shared uh, knowledge around ESG and sustainable investing. Um, so, you know, today the discussion is on climate action and how we integrate that into investment decisions. Um, on that note, I would like to uh, introduce my, uh, our CEO, Gaurav, uh, to, for some opening remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Rajiv, uh, and thank you to all of you, uh, and welcome to NICEF's inaugural in-person panel on climate action. My name is uh, Gaurav Vasisht, and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the New York State Insurance Fund. Before I introduce our distinguished panelists, I thought I'd take a moment to tell you a little bit about NICEF, um, our organization, which is a, a really unique and historic organization. Um, first, NICEF is 108 years old. It was born out of the labor movement of the early 20th century. Uh, a point of great pride for us uh, here is that Francis Perkins, FDR's labor secretary, played a pivotal role in not only establishing this organization, but leading it over 100 years ago. So it's an organization with a very rich history. Another important uh, fact to know about NICEF is that it was established in statute. So it's actually in the law. And it functions as both a state entity as well as a self-sustaining competitive insurance company. An insurance company, by the way, that's fully funded by premium income and investment income uh, with no taxpayer funding. Our core obligation here at NICEF is actually quite straightforward and simple. Um, we make medical and indemnity payments to injured workers, which is a long-term obligation. And the last thing um, I think it's uh, worthwhile remembering about NICEF is that we are a public asset owner with nearly $22 billion in assets, and we invest the premium that we generate in our insurance business as a fiduciary and a long-term investor in the capital markets. So to put it simply, there just aren't very many organizations like NICEF, organizations that are rooted in labor, that function as an insurer, that are part of the state, um, are public asset owners and long-term investors. But it's precisely this uniqueness that brings us to this conversation. We know that we can't meet our obligations to injured workers unless we ensure the long-term security and growth of our investment portfolio. But doing that in light of climate change isn't easy. It brings opportunities and risks, but it also brings a lot of uncertainty and challenges. So in recognition of this, last year, NICEF published its climate action plan. The plan focused on decarbonizing our investment portfolio, financing climate solutions, and collaboration and engagement. But the story really doesn't end there for us. That's just the beginning. The how we get there really matters. How do we accomplish our objectives in a way that has a positive impact on the real economy, that ensures a just transition for workers and communities? How do we do that with limited data, a lack of reporting standards, um, or as some have pointed out, agreement around the price of carbon? And how do we cut through the greenwashing to make actionable decisions? So again, this is a conversation about risks, about opportunities and challenges, about integrating climate science in investment decisions, creating and responding to the right incentives, and about baking in resilience to create stronger systems. And obviously, we're having this conversation against the backdrop of a pandemic, supply chain problems, inflation, and a war, all in a time of great divisiveness. So we're really honored to have such a distinguished panel um, for this discussion. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Judith Roden, former president of the University of Pennsylvania and the Rockefeller Foundation and a former provost of Yale University. Dr. Roden has authored more than 200 academic articles and 15 books, including The Power of Impact Investing, Putting Markets to Work for Profit and Global Good. 
the resilience dividend, uh, being strong in a world where things go wrong, and her latest, Making Money Moral, how a new wave of visionaries is linking purpose and profit. And I will say that there aren't very many people um, who can marshal the resources of philanthropy, the private sector, and academia towards a common good. And Judith is one of those unique people who can do that. So we're really proud of having you here. Next, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Bahn, who is the, the chief strategy officer of One Concern, a resilience technology company. Jeffrey is also a board member in the Consortium for Data Analytics and, Res and Risk at UC Berkeley, and was most recently chief research and innovation officer at Swiss Re, which he helped found. He's published widely in the area of credit risk, and his recent research focuses on resilience modeling, including through machine intelligence-enabled tools. And one of the uh, very fascinating uh, things about uh, uh, Jeffrey's work uh, that I've been learning about is ensuring natural assets. And he's done just such a, a tremendous job um, thinking about um, synthetic data, about machine intelligence, and about providing insurance for these uh, very important um, collective resources that we have. And finally, um, I'd like to welcome Andrew Perry, the head of investments at J.O. Hamburg Capital Management and a member of its executive committee. Andrew's held senior roles at a number of leading asset management companies, including Lazard, Barings, Hermes, and most recently at Newton Investment Management. He is a member of a number of investment bodies and a trustee director of the Trafalgar House Pension Trust. And if you get a chance, please listen to Andrew's podcast, uh, Organizing the Future, which is just terrific. And uh, I've listened to a few episodes and I haven't gotten all the way through, but it's just a fascinating discussion with a lot of great people. Um, the panel will be moderated by our very own Annika Becker, ESG lead here at NYSA. So please join me in welcoming the panelists and Nick, Annika, take it away. Great, thank you so much for that, Grav. And thank you again for everyone who's joining us live today. And a special thank you to all of our panelists. We really, really do appreciate having this conversation with you today. In terms of today's agenda, we'll start by just diving into our, our panel discussion. We have some very rich questions to be um, talking about today. Uh, that will be followed by a Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions come up throughout the panel, I ask that you just hold those till the end, and we'll be sure to get to all of those. Uh, and then we'll just end with some final remarks from each of our panelists. We definitely have a wealth of knowledge today, so I'm really excited to just kind of jump right in. So we'll start with um, kind of our first question. When we were having our initial conversations to see what sorts of topics we wanted to bring up in today's discussion, it became really clear that in order to talk about uh, climate integration into investment decisions, we had to come at it from a few different angles, and we have to realize that the best way to conceptualize this and con uh, contextualize it is by organizing our conversation into three subtopics. So today we'll start with the idea of science and climate impact. We'll move on to incentives and benefits. And then lastly, this idea of resiliency. So we have a couple of questions um, on each of these topics. And we'll kick off the conversation with you, Judith. How does science dictate policy, and should it? I don't think science should dictate policy. It should inform policy. So I would prefer um, that as a, as a starting point. Um, and let me focus on climate science in particular, since uh, that's the topic for today's conversation. Uh, I think climate science has been made directly available and directly digestible to policymakers since the UN convened the IPCC panels 20-ish years ago. And their effort to really um, analyze all of the climate science that was available and create analytic frameworks through which policymakers could really think about the science, evaluate the degree of certainty that scientists had about one outcome or another, um, was very significant and has influenced um, the COP convenings year after year. So when we have all of the policymakers, um, the countries who are the largest emitters, China, the EU, um, the US, always attending COP and always negotiating new policy frameworks um, under the UN aegis, the science has always been fundamental to those conversations. And I think that is, that's really critical to understand. I think further, um, last year at Glasgow, we know that um, many leaders of financial institutions 
also gathered and committed to using science in setting financial policy and financial decision making. And although the most overt and most publicized part of that was um, their CO2 reduction targets, they had a much broader conversation about other elements of climate science that should be influencing their financial policies and their financial decision making. We've seen uh, R&D for climate related science go up significantly and intentionally more targeted since the Paris agreements in 2015. So here's a place where reciprocally in some way policy agreements are starting to um, drive the policy, the uh, research and development agenda. And we've seen private capital follow those leads in very significant way. Um, I analyzed where venture funding was flowing, what kinds of companies over the last several years. And it's really clear that many, much more um, going into uh, startups that are using hard science to tackle climate change issues than just sort of cool ideas, but that don't have a scientific basis. I'll say one more thing, which is that in parallel, what I'm seeing is that scientists are, work, are working much harder to make their data decisionable and actionable. Um, we've seen many creating um, really up-to-date, um, using up-to-date science to create um, and enable policymakers to model um, frameworks, to model po the implications of policy decisions. So this kind of strat strategic research and science for policy impact is catching hold among scientists. And we've seen several come to stakeholders and policymakers and ask, what data would be most useful to you in your decision making? And as that convergence occurs, we're going to see the capacity for science and policy to really do more than just bump up against each other gingerly and accidentally, um, but really with intentionality inform one another. Great, and I think that idea of intentionality and actionable um, processes is really important, and I know that kind of leads very well into, Andrew, a lot of the work that you're doing, if you want to talk about that. It was just fascinating listening to Judith talk there that you know, the science is an important input, it's a really important pillar to, to what we do. The science has been hardening, getting more certain on climate change, so as we keep go, going through the IPCC reports, the confidence in the predictions gets higher, uh, you know, the narrowing of the, the, the range of outcomes is really very important. But it is one pillar, and uh, as Annika said, we, we, on the investment side, whether I put my asset manager hat on or my asset owner's hat on, we have to say, what does it tell us? How does it inform us to make decisions? And I think really what Judith brought out there was the science now has been elevated to a national policy debate. You know, the, uh, the COP debates, whether they failed ultimately mm -hmm. or not, is not particularly relevant because they are beginning to frame national laws. They're beginning to frame changing corporate behavior. They're changing policies. Think of the Inflation Reduction Act. Think of the EU Sustainable Taxonomy. So you need to understand what the science is telling our policymakers, what it's telling our corporates, because it is actually framing the debate on capital allocation. It is framing innovation. It is framing opportunities, and it's highlighting increasing amounts of risk. Now, there is no certainty in anything that we do. In fact, investment is based around uncertainty. What the science helps you do is to navigate through that and put some boundaries around that uncertainty to actually explore investment opportunities and emergent risks. And for me, that's what I find the most exciting about it. You know, I was a mathematician by background, but for me, it's about how does it help me make real world allocations? Because after 40 years in this industry, my primary job has not changed. My job is to make my clients money. You know, it might sound old fashioned and a bit vulgar, but that's what we're there to do to meet their savings and retirement, you know, their obligations. And for me, it's being better informed on the parameters of the system I operate within. The incentives that we'll come on to is such an important part, and science 
is an important and central pillar to that. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And Gaurav, I know that this is something that we think a lot about here at NYSEF as well, if you want to share your perspective. Sure. Um, so uh, I'll just piggyback off of what Andrew just said. Um, you know, from, a, from the perspective of a public asset owner uh, and a long-term investor with a fiduciary obligation, our primary focus is long-term, sustainable, meaningful returns. And um, f viewing this discussion through that lens, um, you, know, you have to be informed by and consider the climate science. I think, you know, given the science um, and as the economy decarbonizes, uh, some businesses will be left out um, and fall behind. They're going to become uncompetitive. They will have lower returns, more volatility. On the other hand, we're going to see more leaders emerge. And so as you think about a decarbonizing economy, um, climate science becomes very important. The key question then is how do you actually integrate climate science into your decisions um, uh, when you don't have a lot of robust data um, and reporting standards? And I think that's where a lot of the work uh, that, that Judith um, and, and Jeff and Andrew have been doing becomes that much more important. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, incorporating climate science is very important as we move forward to a decarbonized economy. I think the key question will be how we get there. Great. So now that we've heard um, those perspectives, I think the question really for this audience especially mm -hmm. becomes, how do we integrate climate science into investment policy? Jeff, do you want to start us off? Sure. I think the, the important thing to, <clears throat> to remember there is to figure out, uh, building on the comments that, that have been made, what we can make strong statements about. So for example, we know uh, that the climate science is telling us that, that we're going to have differing changes around the underlying risk related to, to climate. Uh, and so with that as a basis, I think it's important that the incentives we develop for our uh, in investment policy build on the things that we know. And, and I often think about this problem through the, the lens of, of how we do modeling inside insurance. So I worked at Swiss Re for a number of years. And we, we make a difference, uh, we, we, we make an analytical difference between risk, which is where we understand the parameters driving the distribution of losses, and ambiguity. <clears throat> and ambiguity is best described as the unknown unknowns. So one of the things that climate change has done is it's introduced a lot of ambiguity into longer term investment uh, policy decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we have trouble. So we've got that problem. The second problem is we have this cognitive bias as human beings where we tend to overestimate change in the short term and we underestimate change in the long term. And I think it's important for a lot of institutions, and we were talking about this last night, to be very careful about matching the duration of your obligations. For, and for a lot of the entities that I interact with, whether they be reinsurers or uh, pension funds, uh, or even just regular insurers, uh, often their investment policy is driven by one to three year uh, uh, focus and, and not uh, the actual duration of the liabilities. Now part of that has to do with the fact that there's not enough investments with proper long-term uh, durations. You know, so uh, like I would like to see more infrastructure related uh, investment paper. I mean, we certainly need that in, the, in this country. And so some of this is also incentivizing the investment creators so that we have the right kinds of investments. Because otherwise we end up misallocating capital at a national or a global level, which is often what we see now. I mean, we, we, and one of the great things about capitalism is you do get these corrections. So we kind of overallocate to tech. And if you think about the amount of capital that's gone into figuring out how to manipulate us to buy things, uh, that's not a good thing. So hopefully that tempers and we can now look more carefully at things like climate. And I think that the, the other thing to appreciate is that the uncertainty in the direction is not that much, meaning climate is uh, deteriorating in terms of the way it interacts with us as, as people dependent on things like ecosystem services. Uh, Gaurav mentioned that I do natural assets. It's like thinking about the value we derive from ecosystem services such as uh, the air we breathe, the oceans, coastal protection, coral reefs, mangrove swamps, urban forests, 
all of that is valuable and not very well managed because we don't necessarily think about the incentives for protecting it. And these are opportunities actually for creating new investments that would be perfectly uh, sensible and proper, would meet the proper incentives for dealing with long-term obligations. I think the, the th same is also true for infrastructure. So I think those are some of the things we need to think about, but uh, the, the key point is this framing of what we know and what we don't know and being, being careful about in, ensuring that, that, that we're not kind of deceiving ourselves about those, those two pieces. We know enough that this is a problem around climate that we do need to think about how this enters into our investment uh, allocation process. Great, and, and I think already you can start to see these three subtopics we talked about in the beginning are all very much connected. Um, and, and Andrew, you started to talk about this in your last answer if you wanted to continue that conversation. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad Jeff picked up on the uncertainty you know, because the uncertainty is such an integral part of you know, the day job as an, an asset manager and having an adaptive approach. And I think there's some challenges in deploying the thinking of the sciences into your decision-making process. And I think we see this in Europe in particular where a lot of people will think that reporting of your climate metrics um, is actually part of the solution itself. Now, transparency is all well and good, but if the numbers themselves don't inform a decision, then they are you know, they're not really that helpful. And if, if it, in fact, they can be disadvantageous if you then think you've done the job by just mere reporting. So I, I, I think sort of there's too much emphasis on reporting in Europe and not on connection to, to, uh, to actual outcomes. I think that also drives the investment decision making into passive. And I think well, if you're being entirely passive in an adaptive system with a high level of uncertainty, you're almost going to be precisely wrong over the medium to long term. So there's, you know, there is a case for having a more adaptive approach to thinking about the changing influences uh, within the system. Um, you know, often when I sit on with a, my acid owner hat on, I'll challenge our OCIO to talk about what, when they, they're reporting our climate metrics, what decisions has it led to. And so looking at it from here, I think the big challenge that we have as investors is to begin to understand how those metrics frame future decision making, future allocation of capital. Because a lot of you know, metrics around environmental and social issues and climate um, don't link it to financial outcomes. Or they make some very bold assessments about numbers that, you know, over the very long term that you know, don't mean very much. So what we're trying to do is actually embrace that notion of uncertainty and take a forward-looking probabilistic view about the uh, company's likelihood of meeting a particular carbon objective, linking that to its capital allocation, and then trying to find where in the whole value chain of decision making that value is accruing. And that is going to be a dynamic concept. We can, we can understand the science, but different corporations doing different things at different parts of the cycle will be the ones that are overvalued or undervalued. And so we, we, we can't just take an absolutist view in the investment community. We have to take an adaptive view because you know, we still have to find where we're going to make those money and it can be in transition so the bad becoming good it can be in the good provide you know, solutions being provided to for transition but it also could be the risk management and what we should be avoiding because obsolete obsolescence mm -hmm. is going to be a really big part of the transition over the next 10 20 years and it's always been part of what economics should be about shouldn't be to creative destruction and if you think of the size of the forces at work here that element is often misunderstood. I think we should really be thinking about, you know, uh, not just stranded assets, but stranded business models uh, and those that can't change and who are doomed. So you know, it's got a lot of interesting I dynamics. One. I would just add one thing to that, Andrew, which is that I think it's more than really making a, a, a blended kind of portfolio and seeing these various time horizons. I think even the most conservative investor um, who doesn't think that um, their mandate is ESG or climate or, or science needs to really recognize that in this environment we can no longer outrun the risk. It is no longer about black swans. It's about things that are occurring with such frequency 
and are threatening any kind of investment. And so taking these issues into account, even if you're not a committed client, um, a climate investor or ESG investor, increasingly is part of your basic fiduciary responsibility. I, I thought we might have got away with not using the dreaded ESG <laughs> acronym. But, 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 <laughs> really, yeah, but know, I, but, but it's it's as a fiduciary. Point. As an yeah. investor, it needs to frame your investment decisions um, to understand the risk. And it's interesting, the FCA in the UK in trying to frame that has basically said the consideration of environmental and social issues and how they're governed is just fiduciary duty. Yeah. Because it's, a, it's potentially missing out material financial information if you don't do it. So it's comply or explain. Don't use it as a label. I would say there's no such exactly. thing as ESG. It's about a practical series of nuanced uh, material issues that will change across industry, country, and dynamically over time, but it's an input, not certainly not a label to be aspired to. Yep. Yeah. Actually, Annika, can I just give one interesting <laughs> example? I think yeah. we've off screen. Yeah, no, we have, but, 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 but there's this interesting, because uh, Judith mentioned black swan, and this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine, because a lot of things they call black swans are actually technically uh, what an economist uh, who I quite like uh, uh, calls a gray rhino. <laughs> and so a gray rhino is a large latent risk that we just are kind of ignoring, right. either intentionally or unintentionally. And one of those, which I see in my one concern analysis quite regularly, is the fact that many power substations lie in areas that haven't flooded for many, many years because like they're near rivers that just didn't flood before. We're seeing this in California right now. And all of a sudden, Climate change creates this new normal where flooding in these basins is more regular and your power grid is now at risk. And so you talk about fiduciary responsibility, very few investors are thinking about that downside risk. Now this is a very specific example, but it's one that comes out of data analysis today yeah. because we understand these interacting effects. Because a lot of the work that I have a problem in the ESG space is at a high level. It's like, well, I'm going to haircut things at the financial statement level. We now have data where we can actually start understanding causal relationships. And that allows us potentially to go after these gray rhinos. Yeah, yeah, thank you for all of that. <laughs> I'll, I'll transition us now to our kind of second subtopic because we could stay on this for a while. Um, our next topic is on incentives. So how do we align incentives in the system with climate science? Andrew, I'll start with you. Well, I think Judith touched a lot on that in her, the answer to the first question, that the, cl the climate science is now beginning to inform national debate, policy setting, it's beginning to influence interpretation of laws. Countries that have signed up to net zero commitments are beginning to find that becomes a legally binding commitment on the country, but also on the companies that operate within it. So you're beginning to see that you know, the legal system is beginning to influence some of the incentives. Now, the trouble is, though, that not all incentives are positive. You can have perverse incentives, and I think that's something that we have to, to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, I came at thinking about incentives after a discussion with somebody from the IMF who was saying it's about thinking about how the playing field is tilted to see where the flow of capital goes. And it might very well be that you know, some of the incentives that we have in our system at the moment are pointing in the wrong direction. And we've seen that particularly in 2022, where the science hasn't, in, uh, hasn't informed policy making decisions. And that's going to maybe highlight some gray rhinos. So for example, in the UK, we, uh, we have a windfall tax on uh, energy producers. Now they can get around that by investing in the North Sea to produce more oil and gas. Now the North Sea is a very expensive marginal field, which is why we, we saw a collapse in investment there because it's very expensive to get it out of the ground. The chances are if anybody does anything driven by purely tax, it's going to be a suboptimal return on capital employed decision. And you could very well end up therefore with a short term incentive that is reactive leading to a bad investment outcome. So, you know, I think it's not trying to think of incentives as always being positive, but trying to understand, particularly as, a, a, as an investor, where at any point in time those incentives are pushing you, because there is going to be dynamic mm -hmm. tension. We have a mismatch, as Jeff has said, between the, you know, the long-term li you know, liabilities and the short-term investment opportunities. And that's where the dynamism that I have to manage, um, because I have a, a you know, different way of 
thinking about it, obviously, there's the benchmarking challenge and problem. It can often lead to perverse decision making. And the one thing I do worry about a little bit as an active manager is that we see a lot of discussion in Europe and the UK about setting the right benchmark so that if you want to be climate oriented, you have to have a climate benchmark. But then that determines what good looks like. And in a dynamic system that is constantly evolving and changing, that can lead you to making very suboptimal uh, asset allocation decisions because things will change. Policies will change, administrations will change, laws will change, technology will change. So sometimes you have to have that freedom to be adaptive and be willing to be different to the current uh, thinking. But that's why the understanding of the incentives in the system is so important for uh, any active investor. Great, and, and Jeff, you started to talk about this idea of incentives already. If you want to just continue that conversation. Yeah, well, you know, I think it, it, the incentives depend a lot on which stakeholder you're, you're talking about. So, uh, for example, the, the debt investors, which, you know, I'm sure the, the, there's a lot of uh, fixed income allocation in the portfolio for this organization. I, I think that the, as the buyers of those investments, as the fiduciary, by uh, insisting that the companies who are issuing that debt provide more assessment uh, supplemented by outside objective analysis with respect to how they're going to survive this climate change. Those are some of the incentives I think we need to start building into the system. The regulators are already talking about this, but I think that there are uh, investors who it's in their interest to create that incentive. Uh, you know, I worked uh, for a number of years in, in banking, and I remember before the uh, financial crisis, it was not very common for investors to ask about details of capital structure, so like funding, like how, where's your short-term funding coming, about, coming from? And then after the financial crisis, where you had a number of firms that faced severe liquidity crunches, they couldn't fund themselves in the short term, all of a sudden, the investment community, ahead of the regulators, started saying, you know, I would like to understand now what your financing plan is, what your capital structure uh, issues are. In that same vein, I think we're at the point with respect to data and understanding in this space where the investors can get out in front of the regulators and say, well, I want to understand how does your business survive uh, your supply chains, you know, your, uh, your energy access, some of these, these types of problems. Uh, and, and I think these are uh, where we need to put the incentives. I, I was reading recently, there's a town in, uh, in Arizona, I believe, that right now is seeing their water costs go up by an order of magnitude. This is like from $100 a month to $1,000 a month. And that's because they had this, this arrangement where they would buy water that would be trucked in and filled the tanks. That type of analysis ex ante before you have the problem, I think that the investment community really should be thinking about. And so the, the, the incentives ultimately will come from the, uh, the regulators, it's going to come from the, the, the owners and the, the people who are responsible for this. But in the interim, I think these fiduciaries can create that drive to get more information. I mean, one, one of the things that's different today in this space compared to, say, 10 years ago is we now have more data than we've ever had. So this is not just vended data, but it's also data off the internet uh, that can be scraped and curated. There are firms like One Concern that actually do this as part of their business uh, value proposition. You also have better analytics. The machine learning that, that we're using these today uh, is, is really about filling in incomplete data, filling in missing data. And we have a lot more compute power than we had 10 years ago. That all creates an opportunity now to do granular analysis that was not possible before. And I think that's something also that people just need to understand. Because often I find people saying, well, it'd be great to have the incentives to do this analysis. Uh, even if you look at the comments on some of the SEC proposals, some of the response is, well, this sounds good in theory, but it's really hard to do in practice. The truth is, you can do it today. You have to hire the right people. You have to get the right systems. A lot of firms don't want to do that. But if we can create the incentives in the ecosystem, then I think you get to the point where you'll get better decisions and ultimately get better outcomes. Yeah, great. I think that's really interesting. I think it's very true. 
Um, and one thing I want to just circle back to, you mentioned how incentives change based on your, what stakeholder you're talking about, and I think that's very true, and it's really important for all of us to kind of understand the roles that we play within this greater system. Um, so our next question really relates to this in terms of what role do you see as um, asset owners versus asset managers, what role do they play in helping companies transition toward cleaner business practices or more transparent reporting of business practices? Andrew, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, so sort of straddling both you know, sides, you know, it's really interesting to see the debate in the UK about the interplay between the asset owner and the asset manager, particularly when it comes to the other side of data, which is what I'd call stewardship activities and, and the, the actual engagement with corporations on, the, on that data and, and what it tells you about them, or actually even challenging the data because there is still a problem that a lot of data is wrong, particularly when it comes from third party ESG data providers. There's a, a sloppiness still in what is often called data, but is a matter of opinion. Mm -hmm. And so we do a lot of engagement, and we do, uh, and there's a big, in Europe, a big sort of social obligation for engagement around environmental and social issues, often which asset managers aren't well suited to do, because we have the competition for making money, we have to beat an index and things like that. And, and, and it also puts us sometimes in you know, challenging positions about taking a set of you know, values. However, I think what I would like to see asset owners do is, and we are beginning to see this, we've seen this with the asset owners in America uh, engaging with Apple on uh, workers' rights in stores, uh, is that the asset owners, I think, have a, a far more powerful voice. They tend to have the, the longer duration to their assets. They of, often come with a sense of purpose, like NICIF, uh, that is associated with their, their, with their purpose and their incorporation. And, and I think it could, what I think we will see in the future is the recognition that the asset owners can actually become engaged with, in conversation with the companies that uh, they own, even if those own, that ownership is through a third party asset manager. And I think that's sort of going to be a really important uh, element. These companies then, I think, respond far more when it's actually the primary owner of the capital uh, than, than when it's uh, maybe just an asset manager. And even within asset management, the way I see the dynamic working there on that engagement is that if it's the analyst and the portfolio manager, the allocator of the capital, rather than an overlay manager, uh, in a separate department talking, then you get a very different response from the CFO and, and the CEO because they're actually talking to people who might decide to buy or sell who aren't coming at it from a particular values based. But that's why I think the asset owners have a big role to play because they are the owners of the, uh, the primary capital. They are the people that ultimately should be setting the direction uh, that they want their assets flowing in. So I think that's one new area that we should begin to explore more. I explored that area in my book, oh. <laughs> and so uh, moving back and talking about this fundamental shift that we began to see as the asset owners realize that they are the longer term stewards of capital, that's particularly, or that was true earliest, I think, for the large pension funds who are saying to themselves, who do we represent, who do we need to protect, um, the citizens of our country or the citizens of our state? Um, and so began to realize that they could take a more activist view and put much more direct pressure on their asset managers. In March of 2020, GPIF, the Japanese pension fund, CalPERS, um, and the USS, the UK's largest pension fund, issued a joint directive in which they said to their asset managers, um, we, in our diligence process, will be analyzing your attention to sustainability, to climate change issues, to what kind of long-term view you're taking for protection of all stakeholders, in including the environment, <coughs> as a stakeholder. It was a surprising, actually, from that group of asset uh, owners statement, um, but it caught everyone's attention. There are many pension funds now, uh, many asset managers that are pushing, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, many asset owners that are pushing their asset managers intensively in the diligence process um, to answer these questions before they make an investment, 
um, questions around sustainability, around ESG, around human rights, around workers' rights. It's much broader than climate and sustainability for many of these asset owners, again, given their perception of their mandate. So much more use in the diligence process. GPIF has linked their fee structure to their money managers for certain kinds of sustainability mm -hmm. outcomes, um, which is a very significant action. Um, and we see now owners being willing to take funds out when they are able to do it if they don't think that they're meeting their mm -hmm. goals. So lots of momentum in the last um, four mm -hmm. years, I think, on the part of the asset owners who are getting much more muscular, <laughs> much more aggressive than just handing the money over and say, make me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, I also, to your uh, second point, I'm seeing many of the asset owners interacting with the companies directly. So um, the Danish pension fund, for example, took uh, the Danish oil and gas company, which is now known as Orsted, and they lent them money in, in a debt structure, but also a convertible so that ultimately it would come to equity um, in order to build a series of wind farms in Denmark. Orsted is now the largest producer of wind energy in all of Europe. And this came from a collaboration between the asset owner and the companies. So if money managers can be circumvented in some ways by the asset owners, we're going to see a very interesting new set of dynamics. I'll just finish by saying the money ma managers are not only noticing this, they are becoming much more robust um, in terms of answering these requests. We now see every asset class having these kinds of investments. We've seen, as you know, private equity and, and VC jump in with climate funds and ESG funds and the like. We see it in public equity funds, obviously many, many bond structures. So the money ma managers um, are responding to the asset owners with a tremendous amount of innovation um, across cool. all of these asset classes. So lots of interesting things, I think, in these dynamics that are emerging that are so important. And we're very grateful in the UK for Orsted because they contribute half of our renewable energy and at the moment we're getting more than 50% yeah. of our energy coming from uh, in low carbon sources. You know, it's amazing in Britain that we, we've actually managed to decarbonize our electricity grid and yeah. nobody's really noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> Orsted has a, a great quote, um, something along the lines of, in the realm of decarbonization, there's no competitors, only partners. And I think that really relates to this idea in terms of asset owners and asset managers. We all have this kind of shared responsibility. Um, so I do want to kick it next to Gaurav as an asset owner, kind of giving that perspective as well. Right, sure. Um, so I think, look, uh, you know, the momentum that Judith is talking about and, and the, the more muscular nature of, of asset owners, I think that's very healthy. I think the Orsted example is a remarkable example. That's really the impetus is coming from asset owners. I do want to uh, touch upon the incentive piece and how that relates to all this. You know, at the end of the day, um, it's the asset owner that's best situated to focus on these things on an ex-ante basis, as Jeff, Jeff has said, because um, government is reactive. Right? The incentives there are different. Um, so you, you're not going to focus on legislation or government action government tends to be very reactionary. There's a crisis, then there's this big legislation that follows a crisis, it's very reactionary. So it's the asset owner um, uh, you know, taking the initiative, asking those questions, that's really gonna move the ball forward. And that's what makes this space um, that much more important and the muscular nature of asset owners um, that much more important in this um, larger debate. I think the question around asset managers is a great one as well. I think the greater due diligence, asking a lot of questions, uh, I think that that's very, very important from an asset owner's perspective. I do think that asset managers um, should be focused around that due diligence and responding um, and, and sort of uh, uh, paving the way to a greater understanding for asset owners. There are lots of different funds, lots of acronyms, um, lots of disclosures. Uh, I think bringing all that information home uh, for an investor that wants to do the right thing uh, is a very important element in all of this that asset managers really need to uh, take uh, hold of uh, and, and add a lot more value uh, to this equation. Mm -hmm. 
So for our last question around this idea of incentives before we move on to our final topic of resiliency, I think it's always important to really understand what opportunities and obstacles are ahead of us no matter what um, problem or interesting problem that we're facing. So what do we see as the obstacles and opportunities in identifying climate solutions and investment strategies? And how do you see or think that these opportunities and obstacles have evolved in recent years? Jeff, I'll start with you. Yeah, well I think that there, there's a need for the larger community and, and, and I'm talking quite broadly, not just asset owners, asset managers, but also government, academics, et cetera, to think uh, more in, in a, a more comprehensive and detailed way about our end-to-end -end processes that underlie the economy. Because uh, much of the analysis today, I find, is just too partial. It, it's incomplete. So I'll, I'll give you an example. People will say, we need to move from combustion engines to electric vehicles. And so then government provides uh, subsidies, you have all of this going on, but we're not thinking about the energy policy. So it could be the case that we all drive electric vehicles, but if we continue to burn coal, we don't solve the problem. Now everybody thinks that they've, they've uh, uh, contributed to improving the climate, but in fact they haven't. Now part of that, and this is a bit of a third rail, is we don't talk enough about things like nuclear energy. And the truth is if you do deep analysis, things like nuclear energy may be the only path. Now I, I think renewables are great, but we have to be realistic about the costs of implementing renewables. If I want to do solar, I have to use a lot of energy to create those photovoltaic cells, cells. And today, often that happens in China, and that's not being transparently reported. Now, I don't want to get into the, the debate about this all. It's just to point out that the obstacles that we need to get over is to understand these end-to-end -end processes, whether they be supply chains, whether they be energy. I mean, there's a buzzword, they say circular economy. But it's really understanding from that perspective. Once you understand that, then you can start picking apart the engineering problems that have to be solved to get us to where we want to go. And I think this is really where the, the opportunity lies. I mean, there are obstacles in that I think that, that unfortunately, we've, we've been so wowed by things like the iPhone and the internet, we've forgotten that a lot of the stuff that society runs on is just hardcore engineering. And if you go back, say, 60, 70 years, people in the US, in Germany, in France, they understood that. You know, and you had these big engineering firms. We still have them, but they're not the cool firms to work at. And I think that that's something that we all need to collectively think about. And to some extent, if the incentives can shift, for example, if we had a carbon tax, and that carbon tax was reasonably implemented, so you really are hitting the pieces of the the economy that, 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 that are emitting carbon from end to end, not just uh, combustion engines. You know, for example, plastics, to produce plastics, it, it emits a tremendous amount of carbon. And I rarely hear people talk about it from that perspective. People talk about the pollution side of microplastics, which is important, but there's a huge carbon emission side that people also need to be thinking about. So these are just a few examples of where as we start picking apart the pieces, uh, we'll find many op opportunities, and we'll also uncover those obstacles and hopefully encourage the, you know, the different stakeholders, whether they be asset owners or the government. Uh, I like that notion of partners because I think it has to be public-private partnerships is my own view. That can potentially uh, break open these, uh, these opportunities and over to overcome the obstacles. And Andrew, I'll kick it to you. Um, just very briefly, do you tend to agree with these obstacles and um, opportunities, or do you see other ones? Yeah, the, so I agree with me broadly with what Jeff says. I mean, from my, my perspective as well, going back to that sort of notion of reporting, and there are disincentives in the system to think pragmatically about how the real world operates. You know, China is spending more on coal at the moment, so it's replacing old stations with new stations, be priced precisely because it's decarbonizing through renewables and supplying the rest of the world, and it's brought forward its investment in um, renewables by five years. So it's going to have achieved its renewable targets much, much earlier. But you know, the problem with reporting and the problem sometimes with the demonization of certain activities is it means that you end up having a blinkered debate. And that is limiting in your ability to 
you know, make money to do your job, but also it, it isn't reflecting the real world. So, you know, it's like the, the big debate about divestment, you know. Um, so I, I see some of the challenges that we, that we face are about trying to get people to realize that if you want to achieve a low carbon system, it's not always about the solution providers. They're going to be very important. The problem with the solution providers is that's the classic S curve that you'll see. That sucks in a lot of capital. That's great because that drives innovation, drives you know, real world outcomes. But as an investor, only a small number of those companies will survive. The majority of the venture capital we were talking about yesterday, a lot of them will fail. Now, that's really good for the system. It's a challenge as an investor. What we find, however, is that you, you get a lot of pressure not to think about the ones who are bad today and who are actually transitioning to being good tomorrow. Because those are the ones that are mispriced today. Those are the ones that are using the engineering, they're using the thinking to actually recalibrate their business models, to rethink about allocation of capital. And I find those are some of the most exciting because you need the dirty to become green if you want a green system. So, you, so being able to act, you know, invest in those, and this is probably more, far more of a challenge in Europe than it is in the U US, that the transitioning companies, we have this perception that you can't invest in them because they are not ticking the necessary you know, box. Mm -hmm. But they are exciting investment opportunities. They're often chronically mispriced. Now, some of them will die. Some of them will not make the transition. But as an investor, that for me is where the inefficiency is. And it's trying to overcome some of those sort of prejudice views that those aren't part of the climate transition. They are the climate transition if we want to end up with a more sustainable system. Yeah, thank you. I think this emphasis on the transition is really important and something that we need to focus a lot of our energy on. Um, I, I do want to switch gears now to our last subtopic of resiliency, um, and it's, it's a very important one. And Judith, I do want to start with you. You've played a huge role in championing the field of resiliency by itself. Um, in what ways would you con consider be, um, I'm sorry, in what ways should we be considering resiliency in both investment decisions and climate change? Um, We've touched really on the issue, which is this is a moment in which climate has become the new normal, mm -hmm. essentially. There isn't a week that goes by that we don't hear of some kind of event, whether it's a climate-related event as climate change accelerates, and so natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, tsunamis, um, but also other kinds of crises, cyber attacks, terrorist attacks. Um, and building resilience is never more necessary to protect our assets and, of course, lives as well. So lives, livelihoods um, in every element benefit from a focus on resilience. I think COVID-19 really warned us that more crises with more devastating impacts really can be around the corner. That is the gray rhino kind of notion. And it makes the need to build resilience, which is building the capacity to prepare more effectively for any crisis, not just the last crisis, building the capacity to rebound more quickly and effectively if something should occur, and then building the capacity to tra transform and grow if a disruption occurs. Often we say, oh, this is so terrible, I just want everything to get back to normal without recognizing that normal often has the elements that made you vulnerable in the first place. So whether you're doing diligence as an investor or you're leading a company as a CEO or running any other kind of institution, there are five resilience characteristics that really can be built and practiced and they need to be assessed in your investment decision. The first is the capacity for awareness. Jeff talked about it so much. The availability of data and the capacity to use data to make not only investment decisions, but real-time decisions um, for the, uh, whether it's a city or a company or the like, is absolutely essential. The second, and we talked about that so much last year, is redundancy. Um, as we saw all these supply chains go down, and as we've witnessed over the last several years, climate impacts on parts of the world in which we don't live 
can dramatically affect our supply chain and therefore the viability of our company. So you're not only assessing the company in terms of its own geography, making a digital image of where they are, but looking at all of the elements of supply chain. And there's a lot of benefit to looking for redundancy um, when we always, not always, but in previous years have considered it a cost rather than a benefit. And so nicked a company um, for having redundancy. Uh, seamless information sharing, integration of data, integration of teams, the capacity to really share information. Um, after Superstorm Sandy, I co-chaired with Felix Roatan um, uh, the Governor's Recovery Commission on, on how New York might recover more resiliently. And one of the things the governor did was open all the New York State data sets to us. And we, they, the state has amazing data, as I'm sure you all know. Um, none of those data sets could talk to each other during Sandy. There was the transportation data set, there was the health systems data set. And so really thinking in advance about how you integrate your teams, but also your data in ways that enable fast decision making is a resilience capacity. Um, strong self-regulating capacities. What we saw, again, I'll use Sandy because we're all here, um, there really was no need for half of lower Manhattan to go down um, and lose electricity. If, if Con Ed had put smart switches in um, their electric grid and they were readily available and known about, they could have hived off the failing station and the rest of lower Manhattan would have stayed um, with electricity. So this notion of bending, not breaking, of failing safely rather than catastrophically, and of building systems. You know, we, we reify networks, but often networks are rigid and they add to the vulnerability rather than, so how do you hive off the bad part in times of crisis? And then the final characteristic is the ability to be nimble, um, to really be able to change if something happens. If I am an investor diligencing a company, I really, really, really want to look at the de degree to which all of those characteristics exist and they're built and are being practiced. That is, it's no longer useful to just do tabletop exercises. Teams need to really practice together during responses. We did a, an analysis of Boston, um, which was one of the cities that we worked with. And they used every sports win, like if the team won a Super Bowl and they had a big parade or the World Series or whatever, for all of the elements, business, government, um, the healthcare systems, to practice what would happen if an emergency occurred. Were there a hurricane, a terrorist attack? Or, and it's the only mega emergency, the Boston Marathon bombing, in which nobody died even though so many people were hurt. And it's because they had practiced like crazy beforehand how to respond to any emergency. That's what you want to build in resilience. That's what you want to look for in the companies you invest in. And I would make financial decisions around that. That's amazing, that level of preparedness. Yeah. Um, Jeff, you've talked a lot about this idea already, but if you could just share your thoughts as well. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to emphasize again where, where we are uh, with respect to the fact that we now have lots of data, although not well integrated, Judith's point is very, very, very important. Uh, and we have a new set of, uh, uh, you know, a new set of tools, uh, and, and I didn't mention this before, but you know, often people use this term AI without really understanding what it means. And, and just to be clear, somebody that does this at, at a deep level, there is no AI in the world today. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is something that adapts like humans to new situations without necessarily having all the training data before. What we have is machine learning, and machine learning is very powerful pattern recognition. Now one of the things that we're pretty good at as human beings, and computers and cloud network stuff are still very far away from this, is doing credible, coherent scenario analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that's changed recently, though, is that if we think carefully about where the machines can help us, so I've got all this data, 
I can integrate it better with machine learning. That's one of the things that they don't talk a lot about. I mean, machine learning is often talked about by uh, trying to discern behavioral patterns, uh, make predictions, and, ob and that, that's a very powerful application of machine learning. But one of the un, uh, uh, often uh, undiscussed aspect of machine learning is the ability to synthetically create data that completes existing data. And this can be very useful, and we use this to create something that's called a digital twin. Now what a digital twin is, th this is a, a digital characterization of uh, a country that gives you all the property, uh, commercial and residential, all the underlying lifeline networks, power, water, transportation, the, thi the, thi the things that allow us to function as a society, and puts that all together. And now, with the advent of much massive increases in compute power, because that's something also that's, that, that's been quite amazing, say, over even the last five years, the, the amount of computational power that exists allows us to do scenario analysis that can enable assessment of where to allocate your resources. And I guess this is really the, the point that, that I want to leave, because we, we've done some of these analyses uh, uh, at Berkeley, we've done some of this at, at, at One Concern. One of the things that's quite striking when you look at metropolitan areas is you can make an, a, a, a material improvement in the resilience of a metropolitan area by concentrating your resources on about a fifth of the built environment. And one of the problems I see with a lot of, call them climate plans or resilience activities, is it tends to be broad brush. So uh, they'll say, I've got this big uh, budget, we're gonna pro rata distribute this across uh, the, the metropolitan area. And that's actually not a smart way to do this. The, the, the way to do this is to use these new tools to figure out what are the things I can concentrate on that are gonna accomplish the resilience objectives that, that Judith just outlined. And if I were giving this uh, talk, say five years ago, I would say we're still not quite there. But today, uh, while it's still, a ma it's still messy, it's still fragmented, you know, it still is not quite where we'd like it to be, we've made a lot of progress in the analytics and data community, not necessarily bridging into the decision-making community. I mean, this is the, the effort right now. And so I think that that's really the, the interesting opportunity. And it's also important, important to understand the scenario analysis mind frame, because one of the things that's not talked about enough outside of the, the climate science community is the potential nonlinearities or tipping points that might exist in the systems. And you know, I don't hear this so much anymore where people will say there's no consensus in, in the, the climate uh, change uh, community. I mean, people kind of understand that, the, that there is. But one of the things that's not talked about enough is that we may be wrong on the the downside, meaning we're not estimating, and I don't want to be an alarmist, because I actually don't think that the whole society is going to die in 12 <laughs> years or whatever that prediction was. Uh, but I do enough. think there are potentially, potential tipping points in these systems that you can uncover through scenario analysis. I guess that's really the point. And then you can go back and figure out what investments do I need to make? What policy do I need to change? And that uh, can then be, uh, uh, used to facilitate resilience. And so I think that's the opportunity. I do think also, Jeff, that there's you know, new industries that are evolving around yeah. the concept of resilience. So w wouldn't you want to invest in a construction company that's building more resilient materials, materials literally that bend rather than break? There's paving materials that absorb water more quickly and release it more slowly. Don't you want to invest in those companies? They're the future in terms of being able to respond when these climate events occur. So there are huge investment opportunities at the moment in resilience goods and services that I think are not being thought about systematically sufficiently by investors. Thank you. And so I know we're coming up on time, and I do want to save a few minutes for questions. We have one final answer in that uh, question, and that segues us very nicely into that. Um, during our initial conversation, we talked a lot about resiliency across various sectors, and in general, how it serves as this bridge between climate thinking and investment decisions, as you were just saying, Judith. So very briefly, could we just go down the line, and I want each of our visiting panelists to answer this question. Again, we're coming up on time, so 
Very briefly. I'll be quick. <laughs> so I would just add to um, Andrew's comment about not sufficient attention to the companies that are important in the energy transition, that there's insufficient attention to the companies that are focusing on adaptation rather than mitigation. You know, it isn't only about what we can reduce further later in terms of carbon emissions. It's the fact that for many of us, and many places around the world, it's already occurred. And so there's tremendous investment opportunity in companies that really are focusing in the adaptation sector. I just mentioned the kind of building materials or mm -hmm. absorbing water more quickly. There are hundreds of such opportunities. And to me, it seems like a hedge, an investment hedge in a way, while the transition and the uh, mitigation investments will pay off longer term dividends. So I would focus some attention there. Andrew? I think for me, systems level thinking is the is sort, of sort of conclusion from how, you know, the, the debate that we've had. We need to think beyond the silos that we typically view in investment management. We like to characterize things into factors and the very easy, nice, everything goes into a box. You can do a nice Brins, Brins and attribution model. But the world's not like that. The world is nonlinear, it's messy. It's about complex interactive systems and dependencies. And I think we need to do more thinking about that. You know, there's one thing that we have done is a collaboration with the University of Exeter with a Global Systems Institute. Events like this are a collaboration of thinking. You need to think more widely about the inputs into the decision making. Um, as Jeff was talking about uh, scenario analysis, I think that's, we need to bring that thinking into the scenario analysis on asset allocation within our pension funds and our insurance funds and our portfolios because m a lot of the scenario analysis that I see done now is backward looking. Mm -hmm. I really don't want to know what happens to my portfolio if COVID comes back because I've sort of lived through that. I want to know those distributions of future returns and think of thinking of the world more probabilistically. It's not about certainties, it's about a whole range of different outcomes and trying to understand that and use that uncertainty to manage your risk more effectively and to deploy your assets more thoughtfully. Yeah, and uh, at, at a high level, I, I just want to emphasize this this shift toward adaptation. Uh, you know, clearly we, we have to still continue to figure out mitigation. I, I remember about 10 years ago, there used to be quite a contentious debate in the climate community mm -hmm. about whether we should be investing in adaptation because the view at that time was we want to focus on mitigation and we don't want people to feel like there's a safety net. Unfortunately, I think we're past that point. So <laughs> adaptation is, is where we need to go. So I, I'm going to end with a very specific uh, recommendation uh, that, that is, is politically uh, uh, you know, quite contentious, and that's that we really need more investment in nuclear power. Uh, I, anybody who's studied this problem in depth, which I have, I honestly don't see another solution over the long term without nuclear power. And this is not the old light water fission reactors. There is a group of people working on what are called small molten salt reactors. They, do, they don't create the same kind of weaponizable uh, radioactive waste. There's interesting work in the uh, high temperature fusion community. There's a community that sadly was, was uh, disrupted in the late 80s the, the, called cold fusion, but is now known as low energy nuclear reaction that is coming back. Uh, we're still very far away from that, but the, this fusion, this fission work, uh, it's just, th this is, it has to be part of our energy policy. And I know it's not today in the United States. The, the only country where, the only countries where we see this is France and China. Uh, and if you see the, the impact as a consequence of the Ukraine war, uh, where Germany's policy just been stood on its head. This just gives you an example of where you, you can work, work with it. And, I, and I, was, I was talking to a nuclear scientist the other day, and he was telling me that if you, if you were to replace all of fossil fuels with nuclear power, just wave a magic wand, replace the entire world's energy with nuclear power, the waste for that would be something like two meters on a U.S. Uh, football field. For the entire world, that is not very much uh, space. You compare that 
to the waste just on the coal production from one region, which is orders of magnitude larger than that. We don't really talk about, even beyond the carbon emissions, there's all kinds of other health issues associated with, uh, with burning coal. But you know, this is just a very specific example where I would just like to see more people thinking about these problems. We don't have the answers. I just don't think we've invested enough money in trying to understand this problem. If you look at about where we've allocated capital, it's just, you know, we're probably off by at least an order of magnitude as a society in terms of understanding nuclear energy, for example. And I just think that's things that we need to be thinking about. And it really moves us out of the box and potentially solves this problem over a 50 to 100 year time horizon. Thank you. And thank you for all of these answers. It's been a really great conversation. I do want to just for a few minutes briefly open it up to questions if anyone has any. insurance companies are thinking about, that this is somebody else's problem to insure against these hazards, no matter what they are, even if they're, in, even if they're becoming you know, more frequent and more intense, that there are other players and there are other parts of the system that are thinking about these risks, and namely insurance companies come to mind. Where is the insurance community today, would you say, you know, globally or even regionally, in understanding that at some point, you know, their ability to underwrite these risks and their willingness <laughs> yeah, that, we, we could have a very long conversation about that. Uh, but but uh, let me make a few points because we haven't really touched on that, but it, it is a very inf important, important point. First, a little bit of background. So if you think about the specific, uh, say, property risk associated with climate change, uh, for example, but the, and Judith touched on some of the other things that we need to be worried about as well, like cyber and, and terrorism, et cetera. Uh, and that is typically covered through some kind of property indemnity coverage or, or business interruption. Now, the standard insurance product in that space, and this is something when I was in charge of the Swiss Re Institute, uh, they still do this analysis. If you calculate all the insurable assets glo globally in the developed world, we, we didn't do this for the undeveloped world, and then you look at what's actually insured, the gap in the property space is about 85%. Okay, so that means 85% of the insur insurable assets, and these are property, infrastructure, et cetera, just they don't even have this coverage. So that's one problem, and, and, that's a, and, and it's, it's a much longer conversation to explain why there's that gap, but, but suffice it to say that the, the, uh, the capital provision versus the potential accumulation risk is, is a problem, and governments have chosen for a variety of reasons, not necessarily to ex ante cover this. Because, I mean, cutting to the chase, in the end, when disasters happen because of that protection gap, governments, taxpayers, have to come in after the fact, and it's hugely inefficient. I mean, you know, like, like I would like to see municipalities, for example, buy more insurance uh, in, in terms of the way that they would manage these things. But unfortunately, budgets are managed in such a way that it's hard for them to justify paying premiums year after year after year and then not necessarily get a payout versus not having to pay the premiums and then once every you know, X number of years, they have an event. Now, one of the things that I think may change people's minds is the frequency of events as a consequence of climate change. So I will put that out there because I think that may change the dynamics. Now, there's a second problem. The second problem is business interruption insurance typically ties directly to damage to the building. And most events, the building is not damaged enough to create a problem. And so if you're a large cap company, typically, you know, take somebody like Amazon or Walmart or, 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 or somebody like that, they're moving, aw they're moving away from traditional insurance because the insurance companies won't write them non-damaged business interruption. And I could give you case after case 
where you had big events like an earthquake or a hurricane, and the buildings were not materially damaged, but the transportation infra infrastructure was down, mm -hmm. or the power was down, and they lost money uh, because they couldn't operate their warehouse, even though there was no problem with the warehouse, they go to an insurance company, ask for a payout, and they say, no, it's excluded because we only pay out if the building was damaged, your building wasn't damaged, so we're not gonna pay out. Mm -hmm. So what the big companies are doing is they're creating captives and essentially saying, you know what, we're gonna exit the regular insurance industry and we're just gonna run this ourselves because you guys don't seem to be providing the product that we want. I, I wanna say something quickly to give you an answer rather than a problem. Governments really are the problem, <laughs> um, and not, not the insurance industry for the reasons no. that Jeff does, just described. When I was, and so are development aid entities for the lower income countries, because they're the ones that rush in after an emergency and provide aid. Now, do we want people saved? Of course we do. We want to um, make sure that lives and livelihoods are protected. We worked at Rockefeller in an experiment with the African Development Bank and the African Union, and we brought the largest bilateral development aid entities in each region of Sub-Saharan Africa. And we said, here's the data on what you've spent in the last 20 years intervening with aid after an emergency occurs. What if you give that money in advance, have the AU buy insurance, have all of the countries insured, it will cost you about a, a tenth of what you're currently spending on aid. We created a vehicle, made it investment worthy, sold it to the um, private markets, and now all of the responding for the countries that came in, and, and not every country elected to participate in this, is done initially through this vehicle. So that you can create incentive structures working with government and private markets where the incentives are aligned to invest in advance rather than spending four times the amount or 10 times the amount after the bad stuff happens. There are lots of interesting ideas around building these kinds of public-private incentive structures and investment vehicles. And, and actually, just, just one final point. Because of the structure of the market today and the fact that governments come in after the fact, you're getting, this is exacerbating inequality because mm -hmm. the money is not distributed evenly. And so you, you end up getting this huge inequality in terms of the way communities are dealt with. Because the wealthy people, the big companies, they're essentially self-insuring or they're, they're taking, you know, they can mitigate it themselves. And the people who can't, they can't buy insurance at all. And you have small and medium-sized enterprises that didn't think about this problem and they couldn't buy insurance anyway. And then the event occurs. I mean, you can see this with Hurricane Ian. You can see this uh, with what's happening in California today uh, with all the, these atmospheric rivers. And you're going to see a lot of exacerbated inequality as a consequence of these events. Yeah, thank you for that question. We are coming up on time, so um, I think we'll move to closing remarks. But I do invite everyone to hang around for a little bit just to continue this conversation with each of the panelists or with each other. Um, so I, I do want to just kind of go um, down the line if any of the panelists have any closing remarks. I think I've said <laughs> what I need to say. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a, a vibrant and exciting area. It's full of innovation. You mentioned earlier uh, Jeff's work on natural mm -hmm. resources. We're seeing a lot of um, new investment vehicles starting to be experimented with. Um, to protect assets like air and the rivers and, mm -hmm. and uh, lots of creativity around that. And so I would, I would watch that space um, very, very carefully. It's investable and it's critical in order to protect us in climate change. Andrew? Oh, I'd like to say, you know, well, thank you to NYSEF for putting this together. And that's not just being polite and British about it. It is actually, <laughs> it's about collaboration. This is so important. If we, we really need to think not in our little boxes, our little silos, but in this notion of system change, system thinking, and how we're all connected. You know, we talked here for about, we started with climate change, and we talked, ended up on social inequality. Mm -hmm. You know, these things are, 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 are linked. It's really very important to actually have that joined up thinking. 
Because when you're an investor, you want to think where in the whole value chain the value is going to accrue. So for me, in that sort of grubby money-making end, you know, that's how I have to think about it. But I have to think about how it's connected to all these other issues and how we can all can have a collective voice to influence and change the system. Because that notion of resilience, if I turn it into the notion of, of a corporation, it's about relevance. It's not just about resilience. If you're not resilient, you're not relevant in the future. And how do you think of it as an investor about keeping companies relevant in an ever-changing world? And I would just say that, that uh, talk to everybody in your network about this stuff. <laughs> I, I just think that, that, that there's a huge information gap between these kinds of conversations and conversations that I just have with friends and, and relatives. Because I think that, that because of climate change and, and, and now there's enough events occurring that, that you know, people are understanding that this is a big issue, but it's just to think carefully, how, what is your personal resilience? Like, how in your, yourself, your household, the company you work at, the society that you live in? And I think if more people just partner, I love that, uh, that idea, and collaborate because uh, there, there's just there's there's too much adversity in the conversations, mm -hmm. and people need to come back to the local level. And you know, as I've been working in this space now for about 15 years, you know, you, you start thinking about like, where does my food come from? Where does my energy come from? Like, what would I do if I if I get flood inundation in my house? What's my insurance coverage? And these are all painful, often mundane and tedious questions. But I think that just more of us need to have these conversations because that's ultimately Collectively, that's how I think we're going to address uh, this challenge. Um, and I, I just want to conclude by thanking everyone uh, for coming. Uh, what's striking to me is just the level of creativity and out-of-the-box thinking around so many issues. And uh, like so many other cutting-edge ideas, you know, it, it really is about testing and implementing. And I think those are the real challenges and the incentives, uh, aligning those incentives to get that result, I think that that'll be a very interesting conversation. Um, one just quick element on resilience uh, and channeling funds toward uh, resiliency, and I think this is a point that uh, Judith makes in her book, is that, we, that there are opportunities to build back after a storm, after an event. We tend to build back the same way, yeah. but building back uh, in a better way uh, is is a uh, is something we should be sort of thinking about, and I think as an investor, um, you know, anchored to the fiduciary uh, obligations, I think those conversations become that much more important in terms of being able to channel funds to to become more robust and resilient uh, down the road. So I really look forward to having similar conversations and building upon the themes that we've developed here today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you to all of our panelists and to those who came today. I think. Um, this is really just the beginning of a much bigger conversation that we're really looking forward to continuing with all of you. Um, so on behalf of NYSIF, thank you again for coming in. A special thank you to our panelists. Um, please join me in a round of applause for, for thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Annika, for bringing us together. Thank you.